Okay, let's read our mission story for this Sabbath. The title is Church Under Mango Tree. This reminds me of my having my high school classes under a mango tree, actually. Um, this, is hap uh, this was happened at, in Brazil, and the person, this, the main character of this, in this um, story is Carla. The church pastor made a sermon appeal that Carla could not resist. Friends, he said, for two years I have been looking for someone to help plant a church in the, in the countryside outside our city. I know that it is far from the city. I know that it is difficult to travel there. I know that the area lacks the amenities for the city, but we do not, we do not reach out to our rural brothers and sisters there. Who will? Carla, a dentist, had recently moved with her husband to northwestern Brazil, and she was praying for God to use her for his glory. The pastor's appeal struck in her mind. She wanted to help plant a countryside church. She decided to place a wooden box in the church for people to deposit donations toward the project. A year passed, and Carla decided to look for a plot of land for the new church, but the rural plots were very expensive. Then she came across an attractive piece of land on town's main street, and she heard that it was being offered for a low price. She found the landowner, and he offered to sell it for only 35,000 Brazilian real, which is $6,650. She didn't have the money, but she still dared to make a counteroffer. If we give you a down payment of 5,000 real, which is $950, would you allow us to pay off the rest of monthly installments? She asked. How many, months in, how many monthly installments would you make? He asked. We can only pay you 500 real, which is $95 a month, she said. 60 installments, he exclaimed. You want to pay off the land for over five years? I'll go bankrupt in that time. But it's for a good cause, she persisted. It's to build a church. You will, have, you will have helped build a church for God. Have you ever built a house of God? He conceded and he had not, that he had not. Well, there's, here's the opportunity, she said. He agreed to sell, to sell the land, but Carla still needed to find 5,000 real for the down payment. She asked church members to help and managed to collect 2,000 2,700 real, which is $515, by the time that she needed to make the first payment. But she still needed 2,300 real. Then she remembered the wooden box that she had placed in the church for donations. She opened it and found exactly 2,300 real inside. She made the first payment. After that, Carla made a payment every month until she lost count of how many payments she had made. A year passed, two years, in a third year, she decided to make a daring prayer to God. Dear God, would you please help us pay off the debt in this year so we can begin to worship on the land two years early? She prayed, but she didn't tell anyone about her prayer. But God heard. Instead of making one, uh, one payment every month, she made three, four, five. Every month she asked the landowner's wife who, who was in charge of the debt. How many payments are left? By her calculations, that debt would be paid off by, the, um, by September of the year. September finally arrived, and Pastor recorded a video of Carla handing over the last payment. The property title would soon be delivered. Carla went home filled with indescribable joy, but at home she felt uneasy. Her conscience seemed to be asking Carla, how many payments have you actually made? With reluctance, she counted the payment papers. She had only she had made only 48 payments. She felt so disappointed. A year of debt remained to be paid. With great sadness, she reported the error to the landowner. The next Sabbath, the Sabbath school teacher issued a challenge to the class. I'm going to pass out pieces of paper, he said. Write down something seemingly impossible that you would like to accomplish before the end of the year. Carla wrote, pay off the land for the church. The goal seemed impossible. But in October, she managed to make five payments. In November, she made four. And in December, she made the last three. 
church members celebrated the completion of the land purchase on December 19th. Today, 20 church members attend worship services every Sabbath at what they call Church Under the Mango Tree. They are gathering under the shade of a mango tree while the church building is under construction nearby. Carla says, we love our God who can do all things with all our hearts. Part of this quarter thirteen Sabbath offering will help establish four more new churches in Brazil. Thank you for planning a generous offering on September 24. Thank you, Hernabev. That was a beautiful story of God's faithfulness to us. Even though it's difficult, even though we have a crucible or trouble, he's with us. And the church is the bride of Christ. It's the apple of his eye. Our church is. And our mission uh, this week, I mean this quarter, as you can see, is all churches. Well, it was up there. All churches is what we're, we're doing this time at the 13th Sabbath, so please give something to promote God's bride. Let's bow our heads. Our gracious God, we thank you for your extravagant love toward us, the promises, the prophecies, the gift of your son. May we be inspired to go out and bring disciples for you. Thank you for this Sabbath school and everyone who's here today. May we obtain a blessing from your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There is an oft-repeated quote that says, we have nothing to fear for the future, except we forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. As we look back, we can see God's hand guiding through the various chapters of Earth's history and leading his people from generation to generation. Since the beginning, there has been a struggle between good and evil. And this has played out in the Christian world since its inception, in particular, since the time of Constantine. Constantine was the one who brought many practices into Christianity that were pagan in origin, and thus the battle between truth and error was not just a matter for the Christian world to look for attacks from outside, but now they had to look internally as well. The Bible speaks about wolves coming into the flock, giving us the imagery of wolves in sheep's clothing, professing piety, yet clinging to unbiblical practices and thus corrupting the church. During the 1260 year prophecy from 538 to 1798, God's church was in the wilderness, hunted, persecuted and marginalized. Groups such as the Waldensians in northern Italy struggled to keep the gospel light burning during the Dark Ages. From the 1300s and the time of John Wycliffe onwards, the light slowly started to pierce through the darkness as the Bible was translated into the English language, a huge and revolutionary advancement for the church. As the Reformation journeyed on, later reformers such as John Huss and Jerome in Bohemia, Martin Luther in Germany, Zwingli in Switzerland, John Knox in Scotland and John Calvin in France, each would be key in standing for truth during their time and once again showing the beauty of the Bible as light was being unshackled. 
each reformer advanced truth, but the problem was that their followers would often only go as far as they did in their rediscovery of the Bible. In the early 1800s, the great Advent movement looked for the return of Jesus, but he did not come. The tears of this bitter disappointment would form the stream of Adventism that would grow from these humble beginnings into the church that it is today. The challenge today is still to present the beauty of God's word and the love of Jesus to a society that is indifferent, ambivalent, hostile and ignorant of biblical realities. The battle between truth and error, good and evil, still rages on. Ellen White wrote so eloquently about the great controversy between Christ and Satan through time, and we still see it today on a daily basis. Today we stand on the precipice of time, in the very feet and toes of the image of Daniel 2, on the cusp of Earth's history. As we look back, we can see the amazing experiences that God has led us through, but the journey is not over. As a people, we need to be clear on our prophetic identity and committed to taking the message around the world. As we look back, our legacy is assured, but there is still work to do. The gospel still needs to go to every nation, kindred, tongue and people. Matthew 24 verse 14 says that when this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. Whilst there has been much growth in recent years and decades and while many new areas have heard the message, there are still huge swaths of the world that have yet to hear the good news. The Bible still needs translation and distribution. Missionaries are still needed both in far off lands and also in the big cities. The best days of the church and mission service still lie ahead. The best sermons have yet to be preached. The best Bible studies have yet to be given. The best health work has yet to be accomplished. The best schools have yet to be built. The character of Christ and his love still needs a more complete revelation in his people. Don't be an armchair supporter or a bystander, but get involved in the work of God that we can finish it together. Do we have John 14, 1? And it says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I don't know what it was like for Abraham but that would have been a hard thing, very hard thing, to lay his son up on the altar. I hope Brian put up there fear, if you have. Good. I want to give you a new idea about fear. It's false expectations appearing real. Fear, okay, because sometimes we fear and it's worse than what we think, maybe most times, okay? I think, oh, this is gonna happen, but it never happens. 
It just appears that way because the devil is trying to play with us, right? So as I begin this morning, let me open with prayer. Loving Father, we ask that you might bless in a special way, that you would open our ears and our hearts, that we might hear what your word has to say. And to you be the honor and the glory, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus gives a prescription for troubled times. Trust him, no matter what. All of us have had trials and troubles. And if you haven't had one lately, it's coming. I can almost guarantee it. We've all gone through them. And Jesus here says, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I think Jesus is coming sooner than most of us think. And I think the times that are upon us are going to be much, much worse than we ever imagined. When Matthew 24 talks about the times just before he comes, it says it's pretty tough. So I'd like to give you some encouragement this morning. And that's why I've, I've written this out. I'd like you to look at Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It should be up on the screen. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Not some, but all. And lean not on to your own understanding. That's a big problem. We lean on our own understanding of what can happen or what God will do or won't do rather than what he will take care of you through whatever in means of which you don't understand. Verse 6 says, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. When I moved to Hobbs the first time in 1984, I wasn't there but a couple weeks when my car was totaled at the curb in front of the house. And I said, God, I don't know how you're going to provide because I just got out of college a year before and went back again. And I don't know what you're doing, but I know you'll provide because I don't have hardly anything. You know, maybe a, a hundred or two dollars to provide another car because the car back bumper was up over the roof. That's how bad. It was hit, and it was sent from down at the street to up on the lawn at the neighbor's fence. And the fellow that they caught later on had a suspended driver's license and no insurance. So I knew that was a no-go. But I just knelt down and I prayed right then, Lord, I know that you have a plan. I have no idea what it is, but I know that you'll work it out. I've learned to trust him because in college, there was times when I didn't have any money for food and yet God provided. Trust, trusting him. Trust occurs 188 times in Scripture. And trust in the Lord occurs 19 times. God allows trials in your life to build your faith. It should drive us to our knees, but oftentimes it does not when the trials come. 
to depend on God. And if they aren't driving us to God, then he may allow them to continue until you do go to him in prayer. And they may intensify even. Remember the Israelites traveled the wilderness for 40 years. Why? Part of the reason why was to help them to depend on God for everything, every day. I don't know, I, I don't know if you can think about it that way, but I want you to. For 40 years, every day, out in the middle of the desert, they were dependent on him for food and for water. For about one million people. What does that look like? I want you to think about this. Just for water, I saw a graph one time years ago. It was about 120 rail tank cars of water per day. And about 80 freight cars full of grain per day day and that continued for 40 years I want you to think about it they couldn't see where that grain was going to come from they couldn't see where that water was going to come from but God provided it for 40 years 365 days times 40 that's the kind of awesome God that we have. Verse 6 of Proverbs 3 says, In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Job was tested even when God was silent. And sometimes with you and your prayers, it seems that God is silent, but you need to trust him anyway. Amen? Amen. The story is told of a man that was in a Nazi prison. And he scratched on the walls the saying, and I hope you have it. I gave it to you. He says, I believe in the sun even when it doesn't shine. Are you hearing me? You know it's there. You know it's going to come up even though you can't see it. And God is faithful like that. Amen? God allows the trials to deepen our faith and our dependency on him. And don't depend on your understanding of what can happen and how God can provide because you have no idea he's got a thousand ways beyond your two or three or five that you think of. So where is it that you put your trust? Maybe you heard of this story, but I'm going to use it anyway. Of four men... <clears throat> They were in an airplane. And they were about to crash in the Atlantic Ocean. Four men, three life jackets. Or I'm sorry, three parachutes. Three parachutes. The pilot quick grabbed a, a parachute and jumped out. That left the next three with two parachutes. The scientist on board grabbed something and he jumped out of the plane. So that left the minister and the backpacker. So the minister says, well, son, I'll give the shoe to you. And 
And the backpacker said, well, we don't have to worry. We've got two parachutes left because the scientist jumped out with my backpack. We don't have to depend on our own understanding. God has a way of providing. It's easy to assume we've got the real thing when we may not have anything or a poor substitute. Trusting Jesus is vital when you think of your life. And anything less is a poor, poor substitute. You know, Frank Sinatra used to say, I'll do it my way. But that only leads to eternal death. Doing it your way instead of his way. We live in a world where low trust in everything we even see it in church scandals. We say, well, you know, can't trust them either. We can't trust our kids that they won't encounter predators at school. We can't trust law enforcement in every instance. We can't even trust our friends or family because they may abuse us, hate us, or molest us, or who knows what. But I can trust God no matter what. The greatest decision any of us will ever make is to trust Jesus even when the world is completely falling apart. Daniel had learned about God from an early age growing up in Jerusalem. But then he saw everything around him all of a sudden collapse. And there he was thrust into Babylon. I want you to think about it for a minute. Suddenly, everything around him collapsed, and he has nobody but Jesus. Or think about the story of Joseph. Everything was going on pretty good, and then his brothers throw him in a pit, and he's sold as a slave, and then he's accused of molesting Potiphar's wife, and he's thrown in prison again, and he sits there and rots for several years, and you say, God, what is going on? We need to learn to trust God in the difficult times as well as the good. Trust him no matter what. And what happened to Daniel can happen to each one of us. All of a sudden, everything around us goes crazy. 1 Peter 5.7 says, Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Today there's many crises in the world. There's a crisis of truth. We don't know what truth really is because everybody has their own version of truth. Many grew up in homes where the Bible was not the authority. And now today, there's many forces and people that challenge everything that you say or read or hear. And just because your, fa your parents told you something or your pastor doesn't make it true, and they'll be the first ones to tell you that. I heard that recently. Truth has become relative. Your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. It's the saying that goes on today. But we have to decide what is truth. Okay, what does God's word have to say? Daniel had to make that choice. And so did Noah. In Daniel's case, Nebuchadnezzar went so far... <clears throat> To help him forget God. Because if you remember when Daniel went to Babylon, he changed his name right away to Belteshazzar. 
so he would forget Daniel and his name that meant his love for God. But Daniel's faith and trust led him through the trial on food. Food was the first one. And because of he trusted in God, Daniel was later able to interpret the dreams for the king. Then he was promoted to a high position in government, we're told in Daniel 2, verse 48. Later in Daniel's life, as he trusted God, when the edict was, you're not to pray. And he continued to pray the same way every day. And what happened to him? What happened to him? He got thrown in the lion's den. And said, what is this? And what happened? The lions were hungry, but they didn't eat them. And how do we know the lions were hungry? Because they threw the people that wrote the law into the pit and they were eaten right away. So you say, no, it wasn't that they weren't hungry. They were hungry, but God stayed their mouth from biting him. Okay? And he prayed to God no matter what. <clears throat> Isaiah 26, 3 and 4. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. Did you catch that? I want you to catch that. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he entrusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for it is in Yah, or Yahweh, the Lord, is everlasting strength. How about Noah? You remember Noah? He preached for 120 years. But you know, the professors of weather said it never rained and it can't rain. His friends thought he was crazy. For 120 years, he built the ark. And then he got in. I, I would have thought when the people saw the animals get in by themselves that they would have said, maybe there's some truth to this. Maybe. You know, because they got in by themselves. He didn't usher them in. They went in by themselves. He stood fast against the tremendous ridicule by all the professors and others of the time. And he and his family were prepared when it rained because he trusted in God. Psalm 34, verse 8 says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. Let me close with this illustration this morning. Imagine crossing the Atlantic in a big ship. You get out into the middle of the ocean and the captain says, man the lifeboats, the ship is sinking. And the people say, well, I don't know. Doesn't look like it's sinking. I'm gonna stay on board. Another says, well, my wife is handicapped and we can't get in that little boat, so I'm going to stay with her. Another says, 
Well, I don't know. I think I'm going to trust what I feel, and I'm going to stay on board. Leaning on his own understanding. Or how about the ones that get into the lifeboats? Out of all the groups, who's going to be saved? The ones that got in the lifeboat. Okay. Saving faith is trusting in Jesus. You know, I use the, the illustration of the ship for a reason, because a lot of people think they can trust their own judgment, and this is the ship, and they're going to go through the way they think, and they don't realize that their life is sinking. We need to trust in Jesus no matter what. You may not see that your life without Jesus is sinking or without you trusting him is sinking, but it is. Trusting God enough to step off of the big ship of self-run life is what we need to do. Trust Jesus no matter what. Christ died because your life without him is sinking. And he's coming soon. And we need to be with him. We need to trust him no matter what. How many want to trust him no matter what this morning? Amen. Let me close with number 316. Live out thy life within me.